but that God honors effort. You make an effort, bless God, He blesses you for it. And I'm glad to see you this morning. I'm glad that there's a good crowd here. That's, that's encouraging to me to see a good crowd. Let me give you another announcement before I forget that somebody has to look. Uh, there's going to be a drive by bridal shower. Man, this COVID stuff changes everything, don't it? And what you just need to do is drive by the church on Sunday, on September the 13th, and, and Kayla and Will back there is they're registered at the Walmart. Bring them a gift, bring them something, and, and make fun of them. <laughs> <laughs> Your life stinks in the change, what's this? Drive by, gonna have a drive by bridal shower. I believe that's the first one I've ever heard. Now, Nadine had a drive by birthday party. That's pretty good, but she didn't get no cake. And drove, drove by and took, uh, and took Nadine a birthday gift. I just thought that was good. She enjoyed it, huh? You got a cookie. I got a cookie. I forgot about that cookie. Yep, got a cookie. It was good, too. Who made that cookies? I need a recipe. That was good. And so don't forget, uh, September the 13th, on Sunday at 2 to 4 p.m., to drive by the church and wish Kayla and Will uh, a happy life together. I know that there's no better way than you can live uh, than live a married life with somebody that God wants you to be with. So it's the uh, first time I've ever heard of that. Y'all don't forget that. Uh, I want to mention a few prayer requests again. A man named Willie Fields. Man that I know lives over in Watauga had a um, he had a blood vein bust in his brain and he had a major stroke and uh, they took him in the operating room and they can't get through the blood pockets in his head so it looks real serious. Remember to pray for Willie Fields uh, again. Uh, Sister Carol and Sister Patricia Collins and Carol and all the ones that I mentioned before. I hope I didn't forget anybody. And remember to pray for each other. That's the good part of being in a church family, ain't it? When you're down, when you're sick, you know that there's people praying for you. So friends will come and, and sing us a, a solo, and then Kathy's going to sing, and then we're going to get right into the message of what God's given to give us for you this morning. Sadly, Facebook changed their interface. Well, I'm recording on my own account, so I'm going to put it up on our YouTube and hopefully onto our church's channel later. So that's why that happened. Apologies. I'm going to sing a couple songs here. Um, one you probably haven't heard in a long time. Um, Wonderful Words of Life. It's page 222 in your hymnal if you want to follow along and then uh, an old favorite in your Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words of life. Words of life and beauty teach. Jesus, only Savior, 
Oh, my God. 
I believe that just as then He's here to move like that again He has a miracle to do He only needs to hear from you And you can ask too much of my God No, you can't ask too much of my God When you're good The peace of mind that seems to leave you behind And you slow To the God of Abraham, the great I am He's greater than any problem you've got And you can't ask too much of my God you can't ask too much of my God. And you can't ask too much of my God. No, you can't ask too much of my God. In the book of the Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ was written down by John the Revelator, John the Beloved, John that the disciple whom Jesus loved. The first three chapters is talking about the seven churches that represent seven church ages. We are in that last church age right now, the church age. Of Laodicea. In Revelation chapter 3, at verse 15, this is what Jesus says about the Laodicean church. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of thy mouth. Down by verse 20, Jesus is on the outside now of the church and he's knocking, trying to get in. We're going to look this morning at a very familiar story in 1 Samuel chapter 17. If you would like to turn there and, and go along with us in the word of God, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you. Once again, God, we stand before you unable and unworthy. And God, though we have studied, we can do nothing without heavenly anointing. So God, we ask you in the name that's above all names, the name of Jesus, our Savior, God, that for a few minutes you would anoint these lips of clay. And God, use us to be an encouragement to the people. And God, to that one that don't know you, May they be pointed toward Calvary. And Lord, if our church is lukewarm, and you're going to spew us out of your mouth, then there's a reason for it. So God, we pray this morning you can help us to explain it that a small child could understand. And Lord, we won't fail to bow unworthy heads and raise unworthy hands and give you praise for all that you do. For thou art worthy. Amen. Amen. And in the book of 2 Samuel, 1 Samuel, rather, chapter 17, a young man named David, he's the baby boy out of eight boys, and his daddy's name is Jesse. We're going to look at probably one of the most familiar stories that's in the Word of God, but we're going to look at it with a different angle this morning. I mentioned the book of the Revelation because I believe with all my heart that's where the church is today. I'm only 64. And in my 30s and 20s, I could remember when the preacher couldn't hardly preach for people testifying. I remember a day when downtown Elizabeth and shut down at Wednesday at 12 o'clock. And if you needed anything on Sunday, you better get it on Saturday night because nothing was open on Sunday. What has happened well, let's look at that this morning. You want to? This young man named David is instructed by his daddy, 
Jesse. Jesse has three boys that's in the battle. And they're down in a place called the Valley of Elon. And I just would have to believe that this valley is much like the valley of the shadow of death that you would go to, going out of Jerusalem, down the mountain to Jericho. That valley's probably about as wide as from me to the sound room, and it's straight down. You can't see the bottom of it. And you have to go all the way down to Jericho to get across of it to come back up to the other side. I'm talking about a deep valley. I'm talking about a gorge. I'm talking about the gap. And so when David gets to where his brothers are, Jesse instructs him to take parched corn and bread and ten different cheeses and go to the valley of Elah and see how my boys are. And when David pulls up and begins to unload his donkey, it's unbelievable what he sees. He sees the army of Israel. The Bible says they are in array with the Philistines. You know what that means? That means they're standing on one side of the gap and the Philistines are on the other side of the gap and they're looking each other over and they're sizing each other up. In order for them to go to battle, they've got to go down to the bottom of the gap to engage each other. But at this time, they're just looking each other over. And as David pulls up, can you see maybe one of the Philistines comes out with a big long trumpet and blows it and announces, Goliath of Gath, this great big huge man, steps on the scene, starts cussing Israel, starts cussing their God. The Bible says he defies Israel. And David just looks up. And when he does, all the men's knees are knocking. And they all run away. What is it in David that causes him to run to the enemy and everybody else run away? What is it about David that makes him fearless in the face of an overwhelming enemy? I believe we see the answer in verse 29. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? I believe the reason we're, re we're living today in the lukewarm church in that age is because the church has lost its cause. And if the church has lost its cause, then its members has lost its cause. Now you listen to this. When you lose your cause... You lose your effect. Yeah. Mm. You're no longer in effect. You're no longer a log house on the corner in which you stand. Why? You've lost your cause. David asked this question. Is there not a cause? Several thousand years ago, David asked that question. I believe it's more prevalent today. Here's the world's definition of a cause. A principle, an aim, a movement that because of deep commitment, one is prepared to defend or advocate. Now you listen. A cause won't let you set out. A cause won't let you be neutral. A cause will demand action. We see people today everywhere with fake causes. Listen. You might have a cause and a sign, but when you start throwing bricks and loot and burning, yeah. you're a thief. Right. You're a thug. You don't have a cause. You're probably being paid a lot of money to cause mayhem. Right. You're, yeah. you're just useless when you're like that. That's not a cause. That's a fake cause. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a man on TV the other night that while in prison, God saved him. Yeah. He started advocating for other prisoners. He started helping men that had just gotten out. Yeah. I saw a grandmother who had been locked up on a minor drug charge for 22 years. She started advocating for women, standing up for them and helping them. And President Trump rightfully pardoned both of them. Yeah. You see, they have a cause. And a cause is something that the church 
no longer seems to have. Let me show you. Missionaries will invade foreign fields. <laughs> They'll go where it's not safe to preach the gospel. Men will come to this church like Brother Jerry and climb in a van and drive it faithfully. The people will teach Sunday school for years and years. People will work faithfully in the food pantry. Why? Because they have cause. And you see, a cause is what we don't have today. A cause will cause you to knock on doors. A cause will cause you to tell people about Jesus. Have you lost your cause? Well, like I said, David was the son of Jesse. The youngest of eight boys. But before David was ever a king, before David thought he should, before David thought he could, and way before David ever thought he would, David had a cause. Before David was forever listed in the army of the greatest heroes of the Bible, you see, Movies have been made about this topic, Goliath and David. Many books have been written about, about this. But before it ever happened, David had a cause. Amen. Not because he was a superhero. Not because he was powerful. Not because he was skilled. And not because he was a warrior. <laughs> the story of David and Goliath is a popular story. But you listen to this. Here's what I want you to say. There would have been no story about Goliath winning the battle, about David winning the battle over Goliath. There would have been no story if David had not had a cause. Right. Amen. Have we lost our cause this morning? Before women ever sang, Saul has killed his thousands, and David has killed his ten thousands. Before David ever wrote a song, and before David was ever a king, David had a cause. David had a principle. He had an aim, a movement that would cause a deep commitment that he was prepared to defend and advocate. I used to think this, Brother Joe. I used to think that the reason the book of Acts says that David was a man after God's own heart, I used to think that it was because David was so good to repent. I read Psalm chapter 51. You read it. And David wrote that right after Nathan the prophet goes to him, points his finger at him and says, Thou art the man. You're the one that, that done all this sin, abort, uh, murder, and uh, you're the one that, that committed adultery. You done it, David. Thou art the man. And then David wrote Psalm 51. And I always thought, well, David was a man after God's own heart because he was so good to repent. But after studying this, I don't believe that's the reason that David was a man after God's own heart, it says in the book of Acts. You know why I believe it was? Because David had a cause. David had something that was an aim to him. David had something that he believed in so much he was willing to fight for. It. He was willing to live for it. David had a principle, an aim. He had a movement that because of a deep commitment caused him to defend and advocate. Huh. David had a cause. Well, have we lost our cause? Listen, do you believe there's a God in heaven? Do you? Do you really believe it? Do you believe you're living in the last days? Well, I believe that. I believe we're living in the last days. You just can't deny that. Do you believe that there's people in the world standing on the edge of eternity like this, fixing to fall off into a devil's hell if somebody don't go to them and tell them about Jesus? Do you believe that? Well, if you believe that, you have a cause. Amen. And if you don't have a cause, then you must have lost it somewhere along the way. People dying in the streets. We see it on TV shooting each other. Cities looking like war zones. Churches are down. Young people want nothing to do with God. Families breaking up. Homes breaking up. Abortions on demand. And political correctness has run a buck. I mean, it's sickening. It's gotten so bad. Let me ask you something. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause this morning to live for God? 
Is there not a cause to serve him? Is there not a cause to tell the world about Jesus? Is there not a cause? Do you just want to come to church and feel warm and fuzzy and maybe get over it by the time you eat lunch? Do you just want to exist? Do you just want to feel good about yourself? Or do you want a cause? I'm telling you, God saved you to, for you to do something. God did not save you to sit down on the, on the seat of do nothing. God has a job that only you can do. I guarantee you that there's people that only you can reach for Jesus. But to do that, you've got to have a cause. Let's look at what David saw when he come on the scene. Number one, he saw disrespectful insults. Look at verse number 10. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. If you are going to have a cause that's inside your heart, that never needs to be renewed, that never goes away, it's inside you. Every now and then, it rises up so big, you just have to jump up and say, let me tell you how good God's been to me today. If you have a cause, you become God conscious. You can't go outside without you look around and say, look at them beautiful mountains that God made. Look at these flowers that God made. God, you sure done a good job at everything you do. When you become God conscious, you become appreciative of what you have. I mean, I don't have a lot in this world, but I have a home. I have people that love me in a home. I have what I need in this life. I have eat. I believe it's all because God gave it to me. I'm God conscious. And then I'm sin conscious. If I run around somebody that's using bad language or take God's name in vain, I'm telling you, I can't be around that. It gets to me. I, I, can't, I have to ask them, what's God ever done to you to make you talk about him like that? You become sin conscious, and then you listen to this. You become soul conscious. If God lives in here, he shows up here. He shows up here. You can't help it. He is in you. You have a cause. And this day that we live in, this world that is so troubled, we have lost our cause. We just want to exist. And God has a job for us to do. And David pulled up on the scene, and the first thing he hears is disrespectful insults. Now, listen to some of these measurements and weights that you would understand today. This man is nine foot and three inches tall. He's a big, rude, and crude dude. He's a big guy. He has a spear that's 26 foot long and weighs 17 pounds. And his armor weighs 150 pounds. I would just bet that Goliath's armor weighed more than David did, wouldn't you? And when David gets there, he sees all these disrespectful insults. I'm going to tell you now, if you have a cause, the world ain't going to like you. That's right. If you have a cause, they're going to say, oh, he's a holy joke. He goes to that free will Baptist church up there on the corner. You see him leaving for church every single time the doors is open. He, he thinks he's better than everybody else. You're going to hear that if you have a cause. If you live for God, expect disrespectful insults. And then David saw dismal inaction. Look at verse 24. It says, and all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. I remember many times preacher Adams would say he would like to be so full of God and have so much confidence that he would charge hell with a water pistol. If you're going to be that bold, you're going to have cause. If you're willing to walk into a hospital room where you have a sick friend or somebody that's sick that you know, and you're going to pray for them, you're going to have a cause. There's not going to be no time in today's world for inaction. I'm telling you, you can't sit on the seat of do nothing. God wants us to do something. There can't be no dismal inaction. But David, as he listened, he heard 
delightful incentives. Look at verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to this man that killeth this Philistine? Talking about Goliath. And taketh away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him, and after this manner saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. Go back to verse 25. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that is coming up? Surely to defy Israel he cometh up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free to Israel. Man, what a deal. The man that kills Goliath is going to be made rich. He's going to get the king's daughter for his wife. And he's going to live tax-free and so is his whole family. That's a pretty cool deal. Dave, Dave didn't say, what's the problem? He said, what's the reward? Hey, that's the way you are when you have a cause. But there's one thing that I want you to see. I told you that between Israel and the army of the Philistines was a great gulf, was a gap. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 6 tells us of Ivory, and he's far more scary than Goliath. He's far, far more powerful than Goliath. He's nasty. He's cunning. He will lie to you. He will deceive you. <laughs> but between you and this great enemy is a gulf. That gulf is the bloodline Amen. of the Lord Jesus. Amen. And your enemy, no matter how powerful, no matter how smart, if you have a cause, he cannot cross that bloodline. Thank God in heaven. Amen. I have the blood of his son that protects me from the enemy. Read Ephesians chapter 6 when you get home. There was not only a dismal inaction, but there was a demeaning implication. David was told that you can't fight this giant. Son, who in the world do you think you are? Look, if you will, at verses 32 and 33. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail. Because of him, thy servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he be a man of war from his youth. I'm telling you this morning that if you have a cause, you're going to fight discouragement. But let me tell you what you do. Let me tell you how you win this battle. You do not watch me. You don't watch other people. You don't watch people even that you have confidence in. You keep your eyes on Jesus. You see, he is the one who's altogether lovely. He is the one who made it all. He is the lily of the valley. He is the one who saved me. He is the one who died for my sins. He is the one who made it possible for me to go to heaven. He is the one who can get you to heaven. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't watch man. He is the one to watch this morning. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't watch men. He is the one to put your confidence in. He is the one to put your faith in. He done it all that we might be saved this morning. You will fight discouragement. But thank God I have Jesus. You have Jesus. And all he wants you to do is have a cause this morning. Do you have a cause? Have you laid it down? Have you stopped? Have you quit? Oh, you didn't mean to. It just kind of left slowly. You see, that's the way the devil does. That's what he does to man. That's the way he lies to you. He don't play fair. And he will cause you to slowly lose your cause. And you will no longer be an effect in a world that needs Jesus. They're dying by the millions. They're going to hell every second. And we don't even have a cause. Ain't that sad? David was discouraged. And I'm telling you, 
Whenever you serve God, this world is going to discourage you. Keep your eyes on Jesus because He is the one who gives you cause. Now you listen to me. David didn't know a thing about Goliath. This is the first time he's ever saw him. David didn't know anything about war. He didn't. He's just a kid. He was probably 15. David didn't know a thing about armor. He didn't know how to use a spear. He knew how to use a stick and beat a wolf off of a sheep. But he didn't know a thing about war. But David knew God. And David had a cause. And because he did, he went straight to this big giant. And you know the end of the story. David stops at the kid drawn brook. He picks up out of that brook five smooth stones, the Bible says. I used to think, I read commentaries that said this, that David knew that Goliath had four big sons. And David knew that if he killed Goliath, he would have to kill his four sons. So he got five stones to put in his pouch. I don't believe that no more. Let me give you a little bit of kidding in the you know why I believe David picks up five stones out? I believe it's because five is the number for grace. And David, David knew the grace of God was with him because he had a cause. And David was not afraid to go face this giant because he knew God was with him and he had a cause. Do you have a cause today? Or have you lost your cause? I'm telling you, this is the last day. We're running out of time. If you don't pray and ask God to give you a cause, you're not going to have one. If you don't look at people that are lost and see flames burning around their faces, you don't have a cause. If you're able to miss church at the drop of a hat and then drop the hat so you can miss it, you don't have a cause. I'm telling you, if you have a cause, there's a fire that burns inside of you that you just can't put out and you have to tell people there's a way to heaven. You can say, oh, I've got bad news for you. The bad news is we're all sinners, the Bible says, and we're all on a downhill slide toward hell. The worst news is you can't do a thing about it. But all I've got good news. You don't have to do anything. Jesus has already done it all. And all you have to do is place your faith in Him. And I've got better news than that. Well, what could be better than that? It's all. It's done, been done. All you have to do is accept what Jesus already done. Some people, some people, they spell grace and salvation. D-O. It's what you do. You have to do this. You have to do that. Some people spell it D-O-N-T. You don't do this. You don't do that. I'm glad when my Savior hung on a bloody cruel cross as the blood dripped from his body. He stood up and said, it is finished. Dang. And it's spelled D-O-N-E. It's all about what he does. Dang. But I'm telling you, you face an enemy. He's big, he's mean. But between you and that enemy is a blood knife. You don't have to be afraid to have a cause. I sprayed these altars this morning twice with disinfectant. You know why I've done that? I believe prayer is a privilege. And I believe when I'm serious about what I'm praying for, I believe I'll get on an altar. I don't believe I'm ashamed that I'm seeking God's face and his wisdom about anything. I, I, don't, I believe I just want to get it done. That's, that's the cause. You have a cause. God, do something with me. Use me, Father, for something. God, in my heart, fill me. Open my eyes and show me what you want me to do. Lord, give me my cause back. And you know what? God will stand up on his throne. And he'll put his hand to his ear. And he'll hear you when you pray. Amen. And God will give you your cause back. I'm afraid the devil has rocked the church to sleep. Amen. And that's why it's the church of the last age. The church of way of the sea. 
The church that's neither hot nor cold. The church that is lukewarm. It's because the people of the church has lost their cause. And I came here this morning just to ask you, do you have a cause? Or have you just been kind of gliding through that thing? Lord, I'll show up at church if you'll feed me. And I'll go home and forget about some rest of the week. I'll date Jesus on Sunday. And I'll act like I don't know him through the week. Have you lost your cause? Well, I came to tell you, God allows U-turns. And if you don't have a cause this morning, you serve a God that wants you to have one. He wants you to have something worth living for. He wants you to have a fire in your heart. He wants you to have something that you believe in so much you'll defend it and advocate it. God wants you to have a cause. And if you don't have a cause this morning, you're not living life to its fullest. So as they begin to play an invitation song, I want to invite you to come to a disinfected altar and ask God, give me my cause back, Lord. Lord, put in me a hunger for your word. Put in me, Lord, a hunger for lost souls. God, put that fire back in me. Lord, right around me, start a revival. Start it in me first, God. I want to have a cause this morning. I've been silent too long, Lord. I've not done for you what I ought to do. I've been afraid. There's an enemy all around us everywhere, God, and I'm afraid, and I need a cause this morning. <laughs> Lord, I, I want to serve you. God, I want to do what you want me to do. I just went to sleep, Lord, and I don't have a cause. God, I ask you to give me a cause. The front seats have been disinfected too. If you want God to wake up the cause inside of you, He will. And as others have come, you can come. You have the privilege of approaching the throne of grace and talking straight to a three times holy God that created the universe and made it all. What a privilege this morning that we have to be able to talk to our Heavenly Father and ask Him to give us a cause. Don't leave here this morning without Him. And if you don't know Him, you can know Him before you leave here. You don't have to leave this morning not right with God. It's so simple, people fall over it everywhere they go. And you can know Him this morning. You can live in His will. And when you do, you'll have a cause. God, we thank you this morning. People on the altar praying for a cause. It's untelling what can happen in the church if God just put the fire back inside of these people. It's untelling how far we can go if God would just wake us up. If world events don't wake you up right now, I don't know what it's going to take. If you can't see the evil influence that's trying to take this world over, I don't think you ever will. God wants you to be happy. And for you to be happy, you have to have a cause. And he's here this morning, and he wants to help you. Would you come? Amen. Thank you. People are getting help this morning. This morning, God, to the best of our ability, we said what you have us to say. 
I pray, God, it was a blessing. And I pray it was a challenge, Lord, for us to wake up. Because, God, we have a cause if we serve you. If we know you, we have a cause. And I pray, Lord, you wake it up inside of each one of us and help us to understand. We need to tell people about Jesus in these last days. God, we pray that you would use each one of us. Use this church once again. God, is a lighthouse to see people saved in this town, in this area. Help everybody to understand there's not much time. And whatever we're going to do, we better get busy. The trumpet's about to sound. Lord, wake up inside of each one of us. Cause. And God will thank you for all that you did. We pray in Jesus' name, for he is worthy. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning, putting up with me. Your preacher should be back next Sunday. And I just appreciate so good uh, being used by God for a few minutes this morning. What an honor it is for me to do that. And thank all of you, my church family, for being here. I love you. You're dismissed today.